Hey everybody, it's John from JB Subtle Gaming, and I'm here today to talk to you about Brass. So why am I choosing Brass? Well, I recently did a review of the app for Brass, and you can check it out on my channel if you want, or if you want the quick version, overall it's pretty solid. The AI, AI isn't great, it tends to play the same strategy over and over again. It's not the worst AI I've ever seen, but overall I think the app's pretty solid. I just don't recommend it for players that don't know the game as it is a fairly complicated to, game to learn initially, and the tutorials, while they're kind of solid and can remind you of how to play the game if you haven't played it in a while, not a great way to learn. So overall, Brass is one of these games I'm really excited to talk about because it's a game a lot of people really like. It's very highly rated on BoardGameGeek, but I can definitely see why some people may not enjoy it very much. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about because one of the things I really try to do on this channel is try to help people decide what games might be right for them and their taste. It's personally a game that I think is brilliant, but I can definitely see why some people might not think so. First of all, you might think the game is really, really complex. And it is, but we'll get to that. You might also think the game is really dry and kind of lacking in theme. And I would say maybe. And then lastly, the game is a little bit long. It's not super long. It's not Twilight Imperium long, but it can be fairly long. And that, yeah, kind of is. But I'd like to talk about the other two and why I think those other two aren't necessarily true. Well, first of all, in Breast, you're going to be playing cards to do things. But here's the thing. The card you play doesn't matter for every action in the game except for building, and if you build, you either have to build in a place you have access to and you can use that type of building you want to build, or you have a location card and you can build any available building in that location. And that's really what the cards are for. And when it comes down to it, a little bit like Concordia in the sense that you're going to play a card and do a thing, and there are only so many actions that you can do. And kind of one of the keys to the game is figuring out which cards you really want to keep for what point in the age, if you will, because you're going to play through two ages, and they do play somewhat differently, and that is an important thing and does make the game a little bit more complex, but also I think a little bit more interesting and give it a little bit more theme. But again, we'll get to that. But deciding what cards you can kind of use on things where you're not worried about building and what cards you really want to keep and hold on to and what your building strategy is going to be based on what you have in your hand. But first of all, you know, that complexity may seem really complex initially and have a high learning curve. There's a lot of little persnickety rules. Oh, maybe this area isn't available in age one. The, uh, you know, technology stage one buildings go away at the end of era one, whether they've been flipped or not, so on and so forth. A lot of that little detail things might take you a little while to learn. But after you learn it, I actually would say the game isn't as complicated as you might think, because really you have a base set of actions, and you do two of those on every turn, except for the first one where you only do one. And it kind of plays a little bit smoothly once you kind of get the hang of it. So it's one of those high initial learning curve, but it may not be as complex as you think. But one of the main reasons I think the game is brilliant is how I do think the game has theme, not necessarily in its chrome, but in its mechanics. And that's what I want to talk about. So Brass is a game kind of representing different stages of the Industrial Revolution. And one of the things that I feel like it does well in its mechanisms capturing that theme is the sort of semi-cooperative nature that businesses that are normally competing might have with each other. For example, if the yellow player wants to build this here in this slot, they can do so, but in order to do so, they need coal. Well, there's coal right over here that the green player is producing. So they can get that coal, and they would uh, have to spend the money that they would need and then get the coal from somewhere. So they basically would bring this over and use it up. Now, what you want in this game is to have your buildings flip over, which means that they've been used. So once all three of these coal are gone, then the green player is going to be able to score a certain number of points and then move up a certain number on the track that basically tracks how much money you're getting every round because it kind of represents a contract now that's been fulfilled and is going to be continually producing money for that player. So by using this, I am getting coal basically for free. I'm not having to buy it off of the market and then bring it in. I'm getting it for free, but I'm also helping that player to eventually get some points and score some money. But eventually after I produce the iron here that this produces and then this will flip over whether I use it or someone else uses it. So, and this just represents that I would put four iron on this one and then whenever it's used it'll flip over. So great, there's kind of relationships working out, I'm benefiting you, you're benefiting me, so on and so forth. But there are also those tough choices, like for example, 
If the yellow player here wants to ship their cotton, they need to do so at a port, and they're connected to a port right here. Great, so if they do that, then they'll get the reward, they'll get the points, and move up on the track to get more income, and then also the same thing will happen for the green player. But let's say we're nearing the end of the first age right now. They actually have an option. They could use that port, or they could go to the foreign market. And then whenever you go to the foreign market, you're going to draw one of these tiles, and it'll move down a certain number of spaces, and then you'll get wherever you're at on this stage. So you could get up to three, but it goes eventually down to zero, where you're not going to get anything at all. So it is a big question. So if we were at a point late in the game, and nobody's really, or at least in the first age, and nobody's really used the, or, well, the age of canals, because we're eventually going to have the age of steam and railroads and so on and so forth. So I could just go to the foreign market, and this is actually going to clear away and be gone at the end of the, the first age, if you will, because it's a level one building, and basically that will become obsolete technology. So if this isn't flipped, the green player spent money on it, but isn't going to get anything out of it. And if, well, the foreign market is way up here, maybe that's a better choice. However, if it's way down here then maybe that's not so good of a choice. So I might, if it only moves down one or zero, then I'm not going to necessarily get any money for it, but I'm still not giving the other player a benefit, and I'm still flipping it over and moving up on the income track. Well, and there you go, there's one of the more difficult decisions where you have to decide do you want to work with someone else or not. Another thing that's really cool about the game, the way the game works, is the way that money and loans work, and that's actually look at that income track right now. This is a Martin Wallace game, so as such, if you're familiar with his games, you shouldn't be surprised that there are loans in the game. Now, this income track I was talking about, whenever you move up a space, you're not necessarily moving up a coin every time you move up, but every time you move up a certain number of spaces, you will move up in the income that you're going to get at the start of each round. Well, as you get higher up, it obviously gets more difficult to move up another income. But the way loans work is you move down in bands. So for example, this light color blue spaces here are banned. So this is considered moving down one band and then another. So when you take a loan, you can move down up to three bands to get up to 30 money, which can be a big deal. And it's one of those things where you're getting money that's necessary right off the start, but you're hurting your income for the rest of the game also. So deciding when to do that is super important. You can try to hold off for a long time, but you also don't want to get stuck up higher and have to do so, because down here, you look, I may, especially if I time it right, I'm only moved down one spot for this one and then two and two to get a loan for 30. But if I'm stuck in a position up all the way up here and then I have to take a loan, moving down that one initial spot, you know, in, in here it's a little bit better shape, but that's one slot and then another slot. So loans are, again, one of those important business things that you need to time it right, making sure you have the capital to do what you want to do and also be adaptable in case something happens on the board that you don't expect. So the last way this game, I feel like, really has theme and matches, you know, the Industrial Revolution theme in its mechanisms is how the game emulates supply and demand. So we can see over here this board where there are things available. Now there are rules about when you can buy from here. For example, if someone, including another player, has coal that's connected to you, you can't go and buy from here, you have to take what's closest. But there are some neat things you can do. So for example here, we see there isn't a lot of demand, there's lots of supply for coal. The first one only costs you one, and then the next two would cost you two, so on and so forth. But you can also meet demand, you can anticipate demand and set yourself up to fill it. So for example, if I were able to build an iron place right now that say produces four iron, I could fill this in right away and get four, three, three, and two, so a decent amount of money, and instantly flip over that building, giving me basically two benefits because I was able to meet that really high demand with my building. So you're able to think about what the supply and demand is going to be over on that section, but then also on the player, you know, board with the other players. So in the first age, you're building canals, and they just cost you money. In the second age, you're building rails, which function somewhat similar, where in order to transport transport goods between places, you need rails. You're also going to score points at the end of the first age and at the end of the game based on flipped over buildings connected to these places. But you notice rails also cost coal to build. 
So you can set yourself up. So this is a level three building. Like I said, the level one buildings will go away. But if you can have other buildings that aren't level one with coal available to start the second age, maybe you're not scoring the most points in the first age, but you're setting yourself up for not only you to be able to have access to coal and flip over your buildings, but other players to use it. And they may want to build rails connecting to other places, and then they're going to have to use your coal. Again, anticipating what the demand is going to be in the game. And there's all kinds of other things that you're thinking about. So people need iron in order to upgrade their, their buildings to get to better technology. And there's plenty of different strategies. So there is, you know, trying to ship cotton as much as possible. There is trying to meet the demand of coal and iron. And then there's also just building ships. So ships are, well, they're basically a way to score points. So you see that this ship has a pretty high cost. So 16 and then one iron and one coal but 10 points. And there's very limited spaces on the board where you can build ships at. You can see one down in the corner right here. But basically you have to be very careful about that because you need to spend iron in order to upgrade your technologies even to have a ship available and you need to get into a spot before someone else. So the game has a lot of different avenues you can pursue business-wise and I feel like the mechanisms in the game really provide you that feel of having supply and demand, having relationships where you're kind of working together but also not wanting to help the other person making those tough business decisions as you play. So this definitely wasn't meant to be like a review of Brass. It's just kind of one of these things where I want to talk a little bit about, because I do think it's a brilliant game. I do think there's reasons why it's rated so high. And I feel like once you get over those initial learning curve things, the game may not be quite as complex as you think, but there also is a lot of complexity into what decisions you want to make. And I feel like this game is one of these games that I, I personally feel like it has theme. And the reason I'm saying that isn't because there's all this chrome and all these things and these stories you're telling and rolling dice and all that, because that's one way to do theme, but another way to do theme is in mechanisms. I've talked about how I feel like Tammany Hall does that in some of its mechanisms, and there are other games I can use as examples in that there's a lot of ways to have theme, just like there are different ways to enjoy games. You can enjoy games that are just silly and ridiculous and you laugh at, and you can enjoy games like this where it's very considered but there are those interactions, there are those moments where it's like, oh, do I you know, use their building or not, trying to figure out what the other player is going to do. And some players tend to enjoy one or two, or one or the other of those aspects of gameplay, of that, you know, figuring out the best strategy or just having fun and having a lot of theme in the game. But I feel like a lot of gamers really enjoy both, and I'm definitely one of those gamers. I can enjoy something completely silly and something really complex and what you might consider dry. But as far as dry games go, I do like this game a lot because I feel like the mechanisms bring that idea of theme to it. You do feel like, you know, these are things that would be important business-wise, meeting that supply and demand, and the way that the things interact, the way that buildings are feeding other buildings and they're benefiting each player and you're making those decisions that will benefit both of you or maybe only one of you, but maybe hurt you by not benefiting another player, so on and so forth, are really interesting, meaty, enjoyable decisions. So if that idea doesn't appeal to you, if you don't like the complexity of trying to figure out how everything is going to interact, if you don't like the fact that there isn't some you know massive backstory and, and a lot of chrome around it, and that's something that you look at and you say, that's not theme, then you're probably one of those people who isn't going to like this game, and I understand that. However, if you do enjoy you know, making those interesting decisions, and can see theme in these ideas and see the uh, interactions of these things and enjoy that sort of interaction. That's the reason I feel like Brass is so highly rated in the game I consider is brilliant. Because it is a game that I personally feel like has a lot going on and has a really well done theme, not because there's this story about elves and dwarves, but because the things you do in the game make sense and they tie in with each other and there are these tough tactical business decisions that you can even physically see. You're removing the things, you're taking things off the board, flipping it over, filling the contract, and just that tactile nature of, hey, this building now has these contracts, the stuff it's producing is going out to people, they're both benefiting, we're both moving up on the track and so on and so forth. 
it's one of the reasons why I personally really like brass and the you know the reason why I feel like it's so highly rated and if that's something that you can find yourself enjoying while it, this has obviously been a game that's been out for a long time it's kind of considered a classic if you haven't checked it out I can definitely recommend it if that idea of theme can appeal to you well thanks a lot for watching and we'll talk to you again soon